Thank you, uh, Nikki. Um, I hope you can all uh, hear me uh, well. Um, so, hello, uh, comrades and friends. Um, I wish you all a very good day, first of all. And I just want to say I feel honored to speak at the book launch and, and give a review. And I feel humbled because I'm not a veteran revolutionary or well-read economist or anything. Me and the people who I am truly proud to call my comrades, um, we are simply anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist youth who want nothing more than to produce a meaningful movement that struggles against imperialism here in, in the belly of the beast. Um, me and my comrades, we are all young, but we want this movement also to be carried over to the next generation when that time comes. And so that in that regard, um, the Filipino struggle for socialism, freedom, and genuine democracy and peace is one of the best teachers we have because it's one of the longest continuing struggles worldwide. So as the, uh, as the MPA nears its 53rd anniversary, uh, the book On People's War is launched right now. And the book details, uh, of course, the struggle of the masses under the banner of the Communist Party from its inception in 1969 as a humble, lightly armed guerrilla force with indigenous weapons and homemade firearms until the strong army of the Filipino people that it is today that crashes down on the reactionary enemy in the Filipino countryside. And the book deals with many topics, of course, such as semi-feudalism, semi-colonialism, the oppression of the poor peasants and the urban poor, the ever-deepening crisis, and fascism, details the strategy of, of winning popular support, building a broad mass base to wage national democratic revolution, and forming red zones in which guerrilla and party activity can thrive and confront reactionary power. So onto the book, in, in my opinion, there are two topics that really stood out to me. And the first was the relationship between the people's war and the mass base. Uh, in the book, um, I read that one third of the red fighters are actively, constantly uh, waging battle and seeking engagements with the enemy, only engagements that they are certain to win, uh, which is an important point. Um, but two thirds is working with the masses permanently um, and so the people's war, in essence, is exactly what the word says that it is. There is no war without the broad masses support. And there is vice versa, no political power of the people without an army that fights for them. Without the people's army, the people have nothing. Um, my point is that uh, Professor Cicillon's book was very clear for me in forming an understanding that the people's war is not just guns blazing and fighting in the mountains and the jungle, but it is also engaging in, in this cultural, economic and social support and building mass base, you know, teaching people how to read and write, providing maybe healthcare wherever necessary, engaging in cultural performances and acts, um, land reform in the red zones, redistributing foods, you name it. Um, the People's War is not uh, an institution that gives free handouts to the people, so to speak, but it is an, it's an organizer that builds together with the masses. And I read this as a crucial difference because um, instead of just merely handing things out, the people's war, the mass organizations and the parties, they, they build confidence in the masses that society can indeed be changed through struggle. No more false promises of puppets from Marcos to Arroyo to, to Duterte, but mass line instead. Um, and there are other lessons covered as well. Uh, on People's War mentions, for example, how the mass base in the Philippines was almost entirely lost at one point due to a uh, misguided line developing in the movement that claimed the time was ripe to uh, go from strategic defensive to the offensive, which led to an overstretching of forces and the death of many comrades and it required an entire rectification campaign to correct this error. So to conclude my first point, I want to uh, yeah, point out that this information contains valuable lessons because experiences of success are very useful, of course, but experiences of mistakes ensure that other comrades will not make the same mistake. You know, fall in a bit, gain your wit. Um, the experience of mass base contains lessons for activists in the Netherlands as well also. Um, because we, as, as Revolutionary Einheit, Revolutionary Unity, um, we try to organize the people here in a, a way that is different from how the revisionist left, leftist parties organize 
or how NGOs operate or government institutions. So in, in that regard, we take lessons from the Philippines that we have to work together with the masses and, and build on a movement together. And this brings me to my second point, uh, second topic uh, on the book on People's War, which I found very interesting and telling. Um, and that's the question of uh, people's war in imperialist countries. Uh, this topic is uh, discussed in the final part of the book. Um, you know, there are there are Maoists or, or people who call themselves Maoists in, in the Western Hemisphere who hold the belief that protracted people's war, like in the Philippines, is a uh, universal theory that can be applied anywhere in the world. Um, this is a result of uh, the Peruvian uh, line, which holds beliefs such as the militarization of the party, that every party member must also be a member of uh, the, the guerrilla force. Um, uh, so uh, the Maoists of these types have initiated also a debate with our Filipino comrades about this topic. Um, and it's covered very well in the book. And the conclusion is, no, at this point, people's war is not a viable strategy in the imperialist core, in my opinion. Um, it is here in the Netherlands, for example, that the links of capitalism and imperialism are the strongest. Um, and in contrast, the links in uh, the Filipino countryside are, are the weakest. Um, and the contradictions between the outright poverty of the masses and the oppression of the comprador bourgeoisie and the landlords, they are the strongest over there in the Filipino countryside. So in the Netherlands, we as Revolutionaire Eenheid, we take the position that um, a large group of the population here, uh, the workers have also an economic interest in imperialism. And to, to illustrate this point, we, we can look at, for example, how pension funds operate. You know, workers, they here, they pay a monthly sum that is pulled together and, and forms a massive amount of finance capital, which in turn is used to invest in precisely the same imperialism um, that is detailed in On People's War and that compels the, the Filipino masses to struggle for, for socialism and national democratic revolution. Um, and this, this finance capital is used to invest in arm trade, child labor, exploitation of national resources and cheap labor. Um, and its benefits are in returned in the form of pensions that sustain Dutch workers at, at old age. And not to mention the many jobs over here that depend on imperialism. Um, jobs in the harbor, for example, that disseminate goods produced under imperialism, jobs that oversee the exploitation in the global south, etc. Um, so it's a simple reality to, to, that to ask the people to dedicate their lives to the struggle, it's not nothing, and let alone the armed struggle. Um, those who have a vested, imperialist, uh, vested interest in imperialism will not risk everything they have and all the benefits that the imperialist states provides for them. You know, and that being said, um, me or, or uh, my comrades, we are not third worldists that's, that sit idle out of a misguided belief that the struggle in, in the Western hemisphere is completely useless because there are lots of, there are, there are other groups that don't have an interest in imperialism, such as undocumented migrants. Um, there are plenty of social issues here, such as racism, colonialism, patriarchy, or the housing questions that, that we can organize around here with the lessons that the experiences of people's war contain, um, utilizing the mass line, for example. So, and second of all, I think it is also clear on a geopolitical level that the, the world is increasingly shifting from a unipro, unipolar world into a multipolar world. Um, so US imperialism is increasingly faltering and with it also its stranglehold on uh, many nations in the global south. So the opportunities for people's war um, where it does not exist yet and also, um, uh, and also the intensification of people's war where it already exists, like in the Philippines, these opportunities will increase. You know, from the strategic defensive to the equilibrium and then on to the offensive. Um, I think the book on people's war makes it uh, quite clear that the tasks of revolutionaries in the Western hemisphere um, is to build a movement that can provide meaningful solidarity to the people's war that is currently being waged. Uh, and we can play our part in the normalization of the simple idea that brutal oppression like in the Philippines that it warrants legitimate armed resistance. 
and such a movement that, that we built over here, it has to be ready and built up for when the inevitable moment arrives that the contradictions of capitalism and imperialism are great enough here that the revolution can also be waged in the Western Hemisphere as well. And so that is one of the reasons why uh, the People's War in the Philippines is also so inspirational to us. And why it was really a pleasure to read this book. You know, there, there's a struggle against brutal oppression, but no matter how many people are killed by the fascists or how many people are unjustly jailed, the fight continues and the masses, they, they do not give up. And this is proven in practice. The, the, the party is, is uh, the, the, the people's war has grown uh, and it is, it's proven. Uh, millions of people are struggling right now. And, and one day we will also have to struggle on, on this level as well. Like right now we are on a lower level, but we strive to, to also struggle on a higher level. Um, and so we are grateful to take these lessons these lessons on, in the book on people's war, the lessons from our Filipino comrades who, who we, are, we are truly blessed to work with. Um, we take these lessons and in return, we try to give something back. Um, so uh, in conclusion, uh, my honest review on, on the book on people's war, you know, for everybody watching this or who will watch this, who maybe doesn't know much about people's war, uh, this book has questions answers to questions uh, such as why do ordinary people take up arms and risk their lives in battle? Why do people dedicate their entire lives to, to struggle for freedom, democracy, and socialism? Why is it that the People's War is supported by so many people that the mass organizations, the party, and the guerrilla army manages to grow and even pass on to the next generation? Huge achievements. These are questions that I, I used to have as well. Five years ago, when I was 18 and I was first hearing about the People's War in the Philippines, um, because there was no People's War here, of course, and the strongest links of imperialism. Um, in fact, it is precisely the same imperialism of the Netherlands that, that compels the masses to take up arms in the Philippines, in India, in Palestine, Colombia, you name it. Um, this imperialism produces a standard of living high enough for the majority of the people here to get on with their lives without the need of struggle uh, and, and the need for change, maybe. But this will inevitably pass. You know, the contradictions will become sharper. Um, and besides answering such questions uh, to, to readers, uh, the book on people's war serves other purposes. You know, it's a great source of information about the strategies and tactics of winning popular support of struggle. There's lessons to be learned, lessons from, from victories, but also from mistakes. Um, the book is also a fantastic debunk, of course, to fraudulent academics, who I won't name here, um, who seek to depict the CPP and MPA as oppressors, terrorists, and warlords. It's completely untrue. And not, not to mention the, the outright reactionary propaganda of the fascist Filipino government. And, and finally, in my opinion, there is no greater inspiration than the heroes from Palestine to the Philippines, the ordinary people, the, the masses who show such courage and sacrifice and bravery when they pay the price of freedom with their own blood. They do so in service of the masses, and that, that's inspiring. So on a final note, I, I would like to say on behalf of Revolutionary Unity, we say justice for Ka'oris, for all the martyrs, all the victims of red tagging and killing and state terrorism. And we say freedom to all political, to all political prisoners. And um, thank you for, for letting me give this review. And uh, I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. We may cry, shout, sow peace, but there is no peace. The next gale that sweeps from our country will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our comrades are already in the field, lives so precious, 
He's so sweet. By winning the struggle of the masses, as to be purchased by the collective efforts of the party. Whether abroad or back home, the Filipino people and the peace-loving citizens of the Western countries show their support, love, and respect for the New People's Army. Why? Because for over five decades, the New People's Army stands in defense of the Filipino people and the country's national sovereignty. Chairman Mao Zedong said, political power grows out of the barrel of the gun, but it would not grow without the leadership of the party and the support of the masses. The New People's Army has done a lot to gain the support. Withstanding all forces against them, our comrades in the countryside continue to serve the people by helping them in their daily lives, tending to their needs, teaching them up to building a revolutionary government with and for them. This is People's War. On behalf of Kabataro Makabayan Europa, we extend our solidarity to the New People's Army on its 53rd anniversary. We cherish and take pride in our People's Army as the first and last defense of the Filipino masses. We salute our revolutionary martyrs who selflessly gave their lives for the revolutionary cost. We salute the New People's Army. We salute the youth who will continue and advance the people's war. Paglingkuran ang sambayanan, sumapi sa bagong bayan. When I think of armed struggle, I think of unfinished revolutions and a victory long overdue. I think of Andres Bonifacio and all the heroes, all the revolutionaries that came before me, and all the Kasamas I stand with today in joint struggle. I think of people who embody the truest love I've ever known, the love of the people, the love of the masses, that empowers them to make the most honorable sacrifices and take up such a righteous cause. If you love your people, you fight like hell for your people. And they're the reason why I have no doubt in my mind that the struggle will continue and the people will keep fighting back until true freedom, true liberation is won. For me, the New People's Army and the People's War in the Philippines uh, are ways to break the shackles from millions of people and give them a decent life. They they have suffered a, a lot under feudalism, under bureaucrat capitalism, its corruption, and uh, also imperialism. And I think it's really good that they that the Filipino people are fighting back for their liberation. What comes to mind when um, we speak of people's war in the context of the Philippine Revolutionary Movement? I think of it as the chosen path of the working class to free themselves from the exploitation and, and, oppre- and oppression. People's war is carried out by peasants, workers, and other democratic classes of Philippine society. It is never war waged by the bourgeoisie. Uh, People's war is a painstaking process that will require more time, patience, study, dedication, and it requires offering of our lives. Armed struggle is the method employed by more to move forward people's war. It is a necessary tool to crash the machineries of the enemy. The use of arms is by all means a legitimate, just, and correct. And so, people's war and armed struggle are actually intertwined and it is by all means a call for full support. When I think of armed struggle, I think of revolutionary women like Karima Lorena Tariman, mother, daughter, poet, and researcher, killed in August 2021. I think of her poem, Pagkilos, where she says, Kung kaya ang masa, naakala mo'y walang imik, kapag natutong lumaban ay nagiging matinik. 
May mga kasama man na natitigil sa pagkilos, ang revolusyon sa daigdig ay hindi natatapos. Ah, lahat ng bagay ay saklaw na ating kilusan. Katotohanan ito na di ma- maaaring iwasan. Kung kaya't habang tayo ay may lakas sa talino, sa pagkilos nating ialay ang ating bawat segundo. Mabuhay karima Lorena Tariman. Hanggang tagumpay. Well, uh, it's my honor, actually, it's my great honor to actually uh, present a review of Professor Susan's latest book, Imperialism in Turmoil and Socialism in Perspective. This huge volume of writing in front of us was just one year's work. It was impressive, indeed. I wish I have 10% of Professor Susan's energy and he isn't 83 years old. Perhaps we should thank COVID, which made a lot of people stay at home, and some of them did a lot of writing and teaching online, instead of attending too many endless meetings. I'm sorry, I'm just joking, okay? (laughs) Since the book is too thick for me to go through in short time, I will focus mainly in parts that are related to China. It is clear from his writings that as a young revolutionary in his 20s, Professor Sison was inspired greatly by the Chinese Revolution and by the great proletarian cultural revolution. He took home Mao's teaching to heart and led a revolutionary movement that is getting stronger every day. The the revolutionary struggle of the Filipino people in the last 50 plus years is conducted, frankly, in one of the most difficult periods in the world history from a revolutionary perspective. You see, from Paris Commune to the October Revolution, there was nearly 50 years of law in people's struggle. And from the 1970s to recently, there was also nearly a 50 year 
law of worldwide revolutionary struggle with the proclamation, the end of history at its peak. So the struggle of the Filipino people led by the CPP is truly incredible when looking from this perspective. It started just at the end of the last tidal wave of worldwide revolutionary struggle, and it persisted all the way to the next tidal wave of uprising of the worldwide revolutionary struggle that we can see clearly on the horizon. Hardly any other people's revolutionary struggle that combines underground and above ground lasted that long. Experiences in armed struggle as well as in mass work in the labor movement, the peasants movement, the women's movement, the student movement, the urban poor, etc., will make it well prepared to take the opportunity presented by the current worldwide crisis of capitalism. In contrast, the history of Chinese revolution was predominantly a history of armed struggle. They had very little experience in doing mass work in the urban setting. For the communists working in the so-called white area was more or less wiped out by an ultra left line. Thus, after the revolution, the issue of how to conduct mass work under socialism suffered from the lack of that experience, in my opinion. And as a consequence, the emergency of elitism, sectarianism, commanderism, if I might use that word, proliferated. How to be sure that the vanguards stay as vanguards become acute? This was the main focus of the Cultural Revolution. On the contrary, the Filipino Revolution has been a long history of combining armed struggle with the mass work in urban settings. With over 50 plus years of experience doing work in both areas, the prospect of continuing the revolution under socialism will be much brighter if the lessons of the great proletarian cultural revolution is learned correctly. This is where Sisan's book came to place. We can see a tremendous wealth of experience in leading the Filipino struggle during the last 50 years expressed in this volume. He has strategies in conducting underground guerrilla warfare, conducting above ground mass movements, work in the United Fronts, etc. Besides his writing on the Filipino struggle, there's also a host of writing on the current international situation, in particular, the role of the newly rising imperialist power is also very much present in Professor Season's current writings. This part on page 201 is so true that I wanted to read it out loud. After congratulating itself for a long time for helping China restore capitalism, it integrated itself in the world capitalist system and became its main partner in carrying out the neoliberal policy of imperialist globalization. The US is now resentful about China having maintained a two-tiered economy of state and private monopoly capitalism, and is regretful about having outsourced manufacturing to China in a huge way and allowing it to earn large export surpluses and about having given to China all the opportunities to acquire higher technology from the US through direct investment on US plants in China and through Chinese academic gaining access to US research laboratories and R&D facilities of US companies. That is so true. Condemning the Duterte regime for catering to the newly emerging imperialist power is a constant theme in this book, as it should be. There are so many other high points in the book that I don't have the time to read them thoroughly. I want to share just a few points that caught my eyes. 
I agree with the point raised in the part that says on semi feudalism to judge the nature of society. The key is to analyze the nature of the ruling class. If the ruling class is mostly with industrial capitalists, then it is a capitalist society. Otherwise, if the ruling class are big Commodore capitalists and landlords, not yet the industrial capitalists, then it is not a capitalist society, which clearly is the case for the Philippines. This line of reasoning is also the key in understanding the nature of the Soviet Union from 1950s to 1991, and for China after 1976. Capitalist society don't all wear the same clothes. Those that emerged from feudal society look more or less one way, and those that emerged from restoring capitalism from former social societies look very much different. In particular, they might maintain a planned economy for the interests of the ruling class. They might call themselves still a communist party, and they might not be a open labor market, etc. But the relationship between the working class and the ruling class is the same as though that in an openly capitalist society, in particular, the working class masses don't have any say in running the society and have no right to organize, etc. The implosion of the Soviet Union made this point clear. For the ruling class didn't change before or after the implosion, whereas nature of the Chinese ruling class is a bit harder for outsider to see through. In this light, I might not understand fully the reasoning behind all of Professor Cezanne's statements about some of the so-called socialist countries. Someplace he gave in-depth analysis of his point of view, while other places tend to make statements without explaining the reasoning behind it. At least I have not seen his reasoning. For example, the analysis of the nature of PDRK as a socialist country is puzzling. While granted PDRK is very staunch anti-imperialist, that's we all agree, but stating is a socialist somewhat puzzling. The reference on Coachola that spread of COVID where he attributes the success of countries like Cuba, PDRK and Vietnam, et cetera, for having socialist characteristics may one wonder what is the definition of socialism and how China is not under such a definition. Well, because in China today, they pray themselves for so successful combating COVID because they say we are socialists. Nevertheless, the spirit of revolutionary that is determined to change the world that we suffer under is a very clear and inspiring in this book. All right, well, I do have a few gripes about this book and the acronyms using too many and I couldn't figure out what is what. Finally, I figured it out, all right? Well, that's all I want to say, but this is great. And thank you for inviting me uh, for giving this um, uh, review, all right? That's all. Thank you. Dear comrades from the New People's Army, I wish you all the best for your 53rd birthday. Forward the revolution. I was supposed to visit the comrades of the NPA in the jungles of Mindanao to join our struggles. Due to the corona pandemic, this was not possible. In the end, me and my comrade didn't get the visa. We are more than excited to change our plans and to visit you in the next year, 2023. Why we wanted to visit you? We wanted to learn from you, from the philosophies of Maoism, from your strategies of people war. We wanted to exchange our knowledge. Then. It is obvious that for our common goal, the overcoming of capitalism and a socialist international revolution, the exchange and the join of our struggles is a necessity. Once again, we are looking forward to visit you soon. We wish you all the best for your birthday 
Solidarity greetings from Switzerland. When I think of people's war, I think of why it even exists in the first place. Necessity. I think of the contractual worker violently beaten for demanding a wage just enough to feed his family, or the indigenous peasant torn by the illusion of choice, either death by displacement and crushing hunger, or at the hands of the fascist military. When I think of people's war, I think of justice, the manifest expression of people's desire to live a dignified life free of exploitation and oppression. When I think of people's war, I think of the peace that it makes possible, the genuine kind that can only come through intense struggle. And I think of martyr after martyr that died waging it. Caores, Recamonte, Kevin Castro, Karima Tariman, Arnold Jaramillo, Jula Pira, Maya Danielle. I think of the new world they've begun building for us. And I think of the hundreds and thousands of red fighters a ceaseless flow of new people that live to ensure its fruition. The People's War in the Philippines is an expression of democracy, an imperative of survival, and an expression of hope. In the Philippines, where the landlords, bureaucrat capitalists, and their imperialist backers continue to rule with impunity, People's war is the only way that the workers and peasants can possibly wrest power and realize a truly democratic future. It's also an imperative for rural communities who see their children go hungry amidst plenty and who face the daily brutal violence of the landlords and the armed forces of the Philippines. In these conditions, the presence of guerrilla fronts of the New People's Army recalibrate the balance of power and build the dignity, unity, and power of the people. Truly, the New People's Army is an expression of hope for the brightest possible present and the brightest possible future for the people of the Philippines. I think that the People's War in the Philippines is such a strong and integral part of the global anti-imperialist struggle and that the New People's Army serves as an inspiration to so many people all around the world who are fighting exploitation and oppression. And I think for me personally, it's especially the way they are able to implement the mass line, uh, how they treat the masses, and how they genuinely um, aim to serve the people in every way. That um, is such an inspiration for me. And I think that next to an inspiration, it should also serve as an aspiration for us, for us to become the best comrades we can possibly be, so that we can fully support uh, the principal form of struggle. And I hope that also many of us will aspire to join our red fighters and our comrades in the mountains and in the countryside as well. There comes a point when the people can tolerate only so much. Years and generations of unjust mass killings and torture have already surpassed the boiling point. Hell, even the peerless back government can no longer hide behind the corruption that comes flooding to the surface. How can we stay afloat and see the end of the tunnel? It is armed struggle that will help pave a path and give power back to the people. It is necessary as the elite and fascist regimes will continue to do absolutely any desperate and grotesque means to stay above as the people continue to die and drown. Armed struggle is a way to make a stand that the people will not go down without a fight. Without armed struggle, it is already deciding to give the power to the enemy. But with armed struggle an arduous and long battle, we are actively choosing a future that we envision free from the shackles of exploitation, free to the self-determination, free from land theft, free from imperialism.
Dear friends, I wish to thank the International Office of the National Democratic Front of the Philippines and the International Network for Philippine Studies for sponsoring and organizing the cyber launch of the books on People's War and Imperialism in Turmoil, Socialism in Prospect. I also thank the book reviewers Jakob Boden and Dr. Fred Angst and the moderator Ms. Nikki Guzman for giving us an overview of the two books and for encouraging the public to acquire copies of the books. You may use Google search to find out which bookstores and publishing outlets are most convenient for you to order the books. These include the popular bookstore in Manila and uh, Ball.com in the Netherlands and the Amazon, Barnes and Noble, uh, Apple, Scribe, Biblio and Kobo Rakuten. I take this opportunity to relate the two books in as much as they are being presented to you at the same time. On People's War gives you insights on how the People's Democratic Revolution through protracted People's War has persevered and grown in strength self-reliantly in the Philippines. And imperialism and turmoil, socialism and prospect provides the insights why in the current and forthcoming decades the Philippine Revolution would benefit from more favorable conditions in the national and global context. The protracted People's War in the Philippines has been inspired and guided by the teachings of Mao on how to apply the revolutionary class line in the strategy of encircling the cities from the countryside in a semi-colonial and semi-feudal country. And we, the Filipino revolutionaries, have also made our own contributions to the development of the theory and practice of people's war in an archipelagic country in order to overcome the campaigns of military suppression. To assess and evaluate the success of the people's war in the Philippines, it is not enough to simply acknowledge how, from a small and weak force, with a few rifles in 1969, in one district of Tarlac province, the New People's Army has grown nationwide with more than 110 guerrilla fronts, with thousands of red fighters, augmented by tens of thousands of people's militia and hundreds of thousands of self-defense units of revolutionary mass organizations. It, also, it is also not enough to acknowledge that this People's Army has been instrumental in building the communist part of the Philippines in the countryside. The various types of mass organizations, the National Democratic Front of the Philippines, and the organs of political power that constitute the people's democratic government. We must acknowledge and celebrate the fact that the people's war in the Philippines has developed without the cross-border advantages akin to those when the Chinese Revolution was able to receive support from the Soviet Union from 1924 to 1927 against the Northern Warlords, and then from 1937 to 1945 against the Japanese aggression, or when the, the Indo-Chinese Revolution also benefited from cross-border relations with the Chinese revolutionaries. What makes the success of Philippine revolutionaries even more remarkable is that it has not received any significant amount of direct material support from any foreign fraternal party and has been overtaken since the Dengue's counter-revolutionary coup in October 1976 by one more gigantic betrayal of socialism and proletarian internationalism that followed the phenomenon of Soviet modern revisionism and capitalist restoration. Since the re-establishment of the CPP in 1968, the Philippine Revolution has had to contend with and overcome the concatenation of anti-communism, neo-colonialism, revisionist betrayal, neoliberalism, and neoconservatism. The proletarian revolutionaries and toiling masses have advanced on the road of people's war. In the book Imperialism and Turmoil, Socialism and Prospect, we can discern the rise of conditions 
more favorable for the revolutionary movement not only in the Philippines but also in other countries. Since 1978 onward, we have seen the flagrant restoration of capitalism in China and its collaboration with the U.S. in the promotion of the imperialist policy of neoliberal globalization. Now the two imperialist powers are the chief economic competitors and political rivals in the capitalist world that are trying to cut each other down in so many ways. Despite becoming the sole superpower upon the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, the U.S. has continued with its strategic decline because of the worsening crisis of the world capitalist system and the ceaseless wars of aggression unleashed directly or indirectly by the U.S. as the chief imperialist power in the world. The inter-imperialist contradictions are intensifying and inflaming the contradictions between capital and labor, between the imperialist powers and the oppressed peoples and nations, and between the imperialist powers and countries that assert national independence and socialist aspirations. The addition of two new imperialist powers, China and Russia, to the traditional and imperialist powers has not spelled finally the permanent victory of capitalism and the death of the socialist cause. It has resulted in a world afflicted by multiple crises that aggravate oppression and exploitation and drive the proletariat and people of the world to fight for national liberation, democracy, and socialism against imperialism, fascism, and all reaction. Anti-imperialist anti-fascist and, and democratic mass struggles are arising and will certainly intensify in the current and forecoming decades. They will lead to the resurgence of the world proletarian revolution. It is fine that the proletarian revolutionaries continue to lead the Filipino people on the road of the new democratic revolution and in the direction of socialism and are playing a major role in bringing about the resurgence of the world proletarian revolution. Thank you. Five hundred years ago, colonial powers cast their greedy eyes on the Philippine Islands. They saw fertile land and abundant minerals, strategic trading posts, and valuable labor power. The colonizers quickly began their plunder of the land and enslavement of the people. After centuries of colonial and semi-colonial oppression, a puppet class has been raised from the local big landlords and sellout capitalists. Three basic problems continue to plague the Filipino people. Imperialism, feudalism, and bureaucrat capitalism. These three basic problems mean poverty and landlessness. They mean neglect, violence, and exploitation. They mean forced labor migration. To this day, the Philippines is rich, but the Filipino people are poor. The people of the Philippines are suffering. The Filipino people are faced with a life-or-death national democratic struggle for their land, their freedom, and their dignity. They have accepted the challenge. They are standing up to forge a new Philippines. They are waging a people's democratic revolution through protracted people's war. Under the absolute guidance of the proletarian party, the New People's Army is the main instrument of the Filipino people and the protracted people's war. It has three main tasks in bringing the National Democratic Revolution to victory. The Armed Struggle In order for the Filipino people to liberate themselves and make their own history, they must overcome the armed might of the Philippine state. 
in the current strategic defensive stage of the People's War, the New People's Army conducts tactical offensives to make the reactionary state bleed from a thousand cuts. Based on an ever-deepening and ever-expanding mass base, the New People's Army has grown to thousands of Red Fighters in more than 110 guerrilla fronts across the Philippines. The New People's Army relies on the support of the masses in the conduct of the People's War. The sacrifices of the Red Fighters to live a life of hardship in the service of the people's interests inspires the Filipino masses to continue building their new world. Agrarian Revolution The majority of the Filipino people are the tens of millions of peasants in the countryside. Therefore, the main content of the People's Democratic Revolution is the fulfillment of the peasants' demand for land and the eradication of the various forms of feudal and semi-feudal exploitation. The New People's Army helps unite the people into peasants' associations. These associations are mobilized in mass campaigns and mass actions. Together with the people, the New People's Army conducts agrarian revolution from the minimum program of lowering land rent and interest rates, increasing farm workers' wages and more, to the maximum program of free distribution of land to the tillers in places where the organs of political power are firmly established. The peasants are encouraged to collectivize labor and build their self-reliance. They know that the New People's Army will support them in their struggle for land. Building Mass Bases The New People's Army builds bases of support among the people. It links deeply with the Filipino masses in order to help them build revolutionary organizations of workers, peasants, women, youth, students, indigenous peoples, and other sectors. These revolutionary mass organizations are the basis of the organs of political power. The organs of political power are the consolidated will of the masses themselves, through which the masses conduct education, health, cultural, and economic programs. Today, with the help of the New People's Army, thousands of organs of political power have been built in villages and towns across the Philippines. The organs of political power are the seeds of the future People's Democratic Government of the Philippines. The New People's Army is helping the Filipino masses prepare themselves to take political power away from the landlords and sellouts. The New People's Army is helping the Filipino masses make history. China, I don't know how to start, um, has been, um, I think, with uh, Trump, being a great teacher about imperialism and um, um, the Western worship is being killed by Trump in the last uh, four or five years. And now uh, people, well, the government, also the people were very much on the side of Russia. And there are a lot of nationalist sentiment, China being a rising industrial power, and they are not looking for helping the, uh, the weaker nations. And they're very, very much, a lot of people are uh, rah rah and uh, on the Russian side, not seeing the, this is an imperialist rivalry in which the, uh, the ruling class need that kind of uh, uh, support for imperialist rivalry. And so make the work in, among the left is somewhat difficult. However, it is a, one of the few opportunities that we can openly challenge, critique 
debate, argue against imperialism. And um, because we're not talking about home here, we're talking about somewhere else. And uh, so a lot of people are taking this opportunity and just go all out and trying to explain to people uh, what imperialism is and what what can I what I came out is that um, um, a lot more young people uh, get it they understand this is imperialist rivalry but the older generation tend to be um, from a nationalist perspective seeing only the danger from the U.S. not seeing the danger from any other imperialist country and also a lot of people feel that. Um, what is imperialism? Who, um, when the U.S. sanctioned against China, that's imperialism, and the Russians fight back. That's just. Yeah, so that's the case right now. Um, but the young people are tremendous. A lot of young people are uh, curious and debating, and it's it's. Um, um, I, I won't say uh, it's a dominant. Nowhere, nowhere near. However, there's a sizable. Uh, percentage of young people are gravitating towards Marxism, towards Leninism, restudying Mao, and so that's why I get excited about it. In the civil war that is now going on between the uh, uh, revolutionary movement led by the CPP and um, uh, the, the counter-revolutionary forces uh, under the direction of uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, reactionary uh, state. Um, errors and shortcomings um, uh, arise on both sides, no? Now let us consider the side of the NPA. Um, you see, um, let's consider the conditions and means, the conditions uh, of oppression exploit and exploitation provide the NPA um, uh, a wide ground or even a limitless ground uh, for um, their just struggle. They, they, uh, the NPA is fighting uh, for the cause, just cause of national uh, and social liberation. Um, uh, and yet um, uh, these conditions also limit um, uh, for a long while the capabilities of the NPA in the masses, you know, um, you have uh, widespread uh, re uh, retrogressive uh, illiteracy among the masses, and so on. And then um, there are there is there are, are so many uh, factors in uh, um, that bar a, a higher level of consciousness. Uh, there is a religion that promises the pie and the sky, and so on and so forth. So uh, the, the NPA has to do a lot of work uh, uh, in order to raise the consciousness of the masses. And the um, uh, party cadres of the, the NPA, the commanders and, uh, and fighters themselves should, rec uh, should recognize that they have limitations in their own consciousness. And then of course you have an active enemy trying to destroy the NPA. Uh, this enemy, uh, although uh, handicapped by the fact that it is easily exposed as the instrument of oppression and exploitation, they have the personnel, uh, trained personnel and uh, the resources in order to suppress the revolutionary movement. So, um, in view of this, um, um, the limitations um, of uh, the NPA, usually, um, uh, uh, the, the way to find out uh, uh, what, are, what is the nature of uh, the errors and shortcomings is to um, consider uh, the ideological, political, and um, organizational uh, status and capabilities of the NPA. And uh, the NPA raises its uh, ideological level by um, being, by having, by uh, taking advantage of three levels of uh, 
uh, party education, aside from the political military training, um, uh, where uh, uh, there is the emphasis on the military side, uh, uh, although politics in command, ideological uh, education is uh, spread uh, through three levels uh, involving uh, knowledge of the basics about the Philippine society revolution and comparative studies, uh, um, taking into account successful uh, re revolutions, and then uh, you have the advanced course uh, involving knowledge of philosophy, um, uh, political economy, um, uh, social science, uh, down to strategy and tactics uh, in, the, in the people's war. No? So, um, and uh, um, when you consider uh, what are the capabilities, weaknesses and errors um, uh, in uh, relating to the masses, you have, the, uh, you have to examine how well um, the NPA personnel have, um, the NPA commanders and fighters uh, have uh, uh, learned how to uh, relate to the masses. So you have the arouse, organize, and mobilize uh, line. No, in the, um, arousing, organizing, and mobilizing the masses uh, for people's war, uh, involving all sorts of uh, uh, activities. And of course, um, um, you have to check the organizational status. So uh, the, these are um, uh, uh, the general categories under which uh, you can uh, identify errors and weaknesses. And uh, these are also the uh, categories under which you try to raise the level of uh, the, cap the capabilities of the, the revolutionary movement. Uh, the enemy has been lately claiming to have destroyed uh, even uh, as many as uh, three or four times uh, their, their own estimated, it's, uh, his own estimated uh, strength of the NPA. Uh, that's a big lie. And of course, errors and shortcomings occur um, uh, because of the general uh, uh, considerations that I've already put forward. But we must consider that, um, uh, you know, the, uh, there is some impact of, of the enemy side using what they call the focused uh, military uh, uh, operations and you know the use of air power and so on and so forth. But in general terms, the enemy force represents oppression and exploitation by US imperialism and the local exploiting classes. So you, there is a just cause by which the people um, and the NPA can um, uh, always try to master the best and the strongest they can against the enemy. And um, um, let's take uh, ideological edu education, ideological education. Uh, the main thing you can learn in simple terms is, uh, you know, to divide into two. Eh? You analyze your own side, you determine your strengths and weaknesses, and uh, you enhance your strengths and you uh, you 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 um, overcome the weaknesses, and you also analyze uh, the other side, no? And um, and the, the, the strengths and weaknesses, and you um, also analyze the entire process, the entire process of uh, um, civil war or protracted people's war um, uh, with no foreign aggressor yet. Uh, uh, actively in the field in the Philippines. Um, so you go by the, by the uh, line of dividing one and two. Uh, the enemy appears to be so strong, uh, but you can analyze it, you can, uh, uh, you can divide it into two, and in practical terms, uh, you may not be able to be foolish to collide against a superior force uh, uh, at the tactical level. Um, uh, as Mao has pointed out, when there is a superior force, uh, you can withdraw, you can retreat, no? and you can plant mines on the, on the path of the enemy. You can snipe, no? but uh, 
you must your smaller force must uh, retreat. Then it waits for the enemy to divide its uh, uh, its uh, its force. Then you can pick out uh, piece by piece. Uh, 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 the part you are capable of uh, destroying, the part of the enemy that you are capable. Of, you, you can, if you cannot destroy a whole battalion with your platoon, definitely you can finish off a um, a, a a squad doing some patrols or doing something else. Uh, uh, that's what uh, um, the the NPA is equipped with the strategy and tactics of the protracted people's war. You have the basic um, um, 16 character formula of Maul. In the face of a superior enemy force, you retreat. Uh, uh, in the, uh, when the enemy uh, comes, you harass. Huh? And um, uh, while the enemy thinks it, has own, it, is, it owns the area, uh, you can pick out. Huh? Uh, parts and parts of the perimeter, and even you can even uh, insert uh, your squads and platoons to do uh, to do uh, um, offensives. Uh, and it, it, through the in the vastness uh, of the territory, the NPA can slip out uh, in so many ways. Uh, and when the enemy um, Retreats because he has become tired. He has become tired. Then uh, you launch your own offensive. Or there are more advanced tactics like that. when the enemy concentrates on one place, you hit the enemy elsewhere. Or you can bait the enemy into coming to a certain area where you have some small ambush ready. Your bigger attack is, up, is elsewhere. So you remember this uh, uh, dividing. Uh, one and two is not only analysis, but it also involves uh, carrying out uh, tactical offensives against uh, your opponent. So anyway, um, uh, the law of contradiction and the um, uneven development of uh, consciousness and practical ability uh, 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 operate. And so, uh, the NPA commanders and fighters have to keep on raising their level of consciousness and uh, practical abilities. Yeah, these, these protests indeed, uh... They were here. Uh, we, we saw them here, uh, and recently we've also had large protests against um, the housing crisis. For example, you know, uh, there's a big housing crisis here. Uh, there's lots of landlords that um, rent out their their apartments for for way too much money. Um, and there's a massive shortage of, of houses, especially on their, amongst young people and amongst students. Um, and th there are these issues, of course, but um, there is not really any clear militancy or uh, it, and these, these protests are uh, for a large part spontaneous. Um, and to be completely honest, um, like me, myself, or, or we as RE, we don't have like a clear blueprint of what has to be done to make the, the, the people here more militant. And that's exactly um, the point, you know, and I also touched upon that subject in, in the review um, that uh, lots of people, they, they have an interest in a way in, in how the, the system functions here because our, our standard of living, including our healthcare and our housing and our pensions, they are in part a result of Dutch imperialism, you know? And, and so to ask people here to, to, to struggle and, and be, be militant and sacrifice for, for the struggle for socialism, you know, that, that's, a very, that's a very large uh, thing to ask uh, for, for regular people. Um, and so 
to come back to the question, like we don't we don't really have a clear blueprint, and we don't we don't pretend to, and that's I think also the strength of our organization. Uh, we don't pretend like other organizations. We know exactly what has to be done. We have to find out together, and we have to work with uh, the resources that we have, and that, that includes. Our, our Filipino comrades, that includes our Palestinian comrades, that includes uh, all the struggles that we know of and all the connections that we have of people who are struggling on a, on a much higher level. Um, and, and so we try, to, we try to take lessons from that, of course, and we try to um, engage in, in community organizing. Um, and so, so, so we try and, and we experiment and we try to implement the mass line. Uh, one example of what we're currently doing um, is we're, we're going out on the streets and trying to talk to regular people about the housing crisis. So, so we hand out flyers calling for people uh, to, you know, if they have any information about uh, landlords um, that are, are, are doing the, these, uh, doing these bad things, asking too much rents and, and not um, um, maintaining proper uh, care of the houses. You know? um, we ask people like if they have information about these landlords and then send it to us so we can work together to, to maybe build a movement. But yes, it is very, it is a very uh, a slow process um, because people aren't really militant and people aren't at the moment ready to dedicate their entire lives to, to the struggle and, and do these um, big things. Um, so I, I guess that would be my uh, answer to the question. Um, at this moment, like what we're doing to create militancy amongst the people is organized around relevant topics, you know? So, so there's, a, there's a Palestinian community here. Uh, and so we, we try to create a more radical uh, or propagate a more radical line, you know, uh, to to support armed struggle, for example, and and not just organize for a boycott of, of Israel. You know, we we have a, a unit unit dedicated to the Filipino struggle, which uh, is trying to organize amongst the uh, Filipino community in the Netherlands. Uh, we uh, try to organize um, people who who don't have an interest in imperialism. You know, so undocumented migrants. You know, and we 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 stand up for their rights and we. Uh, we, we build, try to build meaningful solidarity. Um, and it's, uh, we, we still have a very, very, very long road to go. Um, but as the contradictions will widen, um, our plan, so to speak, is to build in the meantime, a movement which is ready to take advantage of uh, the, the deepening crisis once it deepens further and further and further. Uh, so I, I guess, yeah, that, that is what we're doing. Um, and we're, 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 we're figuring it out. Um, yeah, I, I hope that answers uh, the question properly. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I wrote a long paper on that. <laughs> um, maybe you can see that on the, uh, uh, I, I forgot where it was published. Anyway, I think it should be. Now, um, the cultural revolution was very, um, um, most valuable. You know, um, um, Paris Commune only lasts um, a few months. And October Revolution, um, uh, was successful, but then how to overcome the difficulty of how to preventing revolutionaries become uh, new oppressors is a uh, universal uh, problem. And the um, uh, cultural revolution provided uh, answer. It has the longest, um, deepest, most broadly participated, um, the, the, the masses trying to learn how to be master society. And people don't born to know how to be master society. You'd be amazed. Uh, the key point is how to distinguish between those who want to overthrow socialism versus 
those have different opinions about how social society should run. And from national uh, issues all the way down to a factory level. And you have cases where in Shanghai, for example, a, a diesel um, um, factory with over 7,000 workers divide up to two factions and fighting each other. And, and the, the factional fighting is say, something that all revolutionaries have to learn the roots for that. It's just that um, when, when you, you can have democracy and what happens when a stubborn minority uh, dis disobey and disagree. And um, so how, so the basic, the, 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 the real difficulty is how to maintain the leadership of the Vanguard party at the same time to have mass supervision over the leadership. And that is a contradiction. And well, just like the contradiction that we face every day between awakening and asleep. You cannot be awake all the time without sleep. You cannot be sleeping all the time without awake. You might be dead. And so the contradiction in social society, is, this is a very deep um, contradiction um, but it is a contradiction among the people. It's not antagonistic. And so how to um, prevent revisionism is, is much harder to, to do than uh, simple phrases or labeling somebody as capitalist voters or labeling somebody as centrist or leftist. And it, it see, the people on one issue can be leftist, on the other issue can be rightist. And also when people un subconscious, unconscious could be rightist, but once they understand they could be left. And so the question is how to educate, uh, unite with the majority and without being um, let go of the diehard capitalist voters. And so there's a tremendous amount of lesson can be learned uh, about the cultural revolution. And when I compared uh, the place like Shanghai, uh, where it has the strongest uh, whole of working class tradition versus uh, Wuhan is a, a more like a newly industrial society, a kind of, uh, city. It has some old working class, but it is very small. And uh, Wuhan is a, a city that um, benefit uh, tremendously from the aid by Soviet Union with many heavy industry built in the 50s. So a lot of young workers came to the factory and uh, when the cultural revolution started, they think they are representing the, uh, um, uh, the industrial working class. And, and, but actually they carry with them tremendous amount of petty bourgeois ideology. They like to do things their way, my way or highway. Uh, you do them my way or not. And just like people, factional fightings are very intense. Whereas Shanghai, a city with a long history, tradition of working class struggle, you will find the factional fighting tend to be much less. And once the workers realize the leaders among their factions fighting for their own privilege, for their own power, for their own um, ego, they lost interest. Yeah, so the contrast of Shanghai and Wuhan for me is very revealing. So that tells me that in a um, Chinese society during the Mao's period, where it have 70 to 80% of population that came from the countryside, and the, um, the tradition of petty bourgeois ideology is very strong. And, but as the work, as, as the industrialization taking place, like today you have 80% people, 70, 80% people make their living by selling their labor. They are the working class. <clears throat> then the petty bourgeois ideology uh, will have lesser, um, influence. And so I have great hope for the future. Okay. Uh, and a short time for this <laughs> answer.
Well, you see, even before we win uh, completely uh, or achieve basic completion of the People's Democratic Revolution, we have m learned much from the experience of the Soviet Union and China. So uh, we have a store of knowledge, but that is secondhand knowledge eventually. Uh, we have all, uh, we have our own self-reliant um, uh, development. You see, um, the Philippine Revolution has uh, proven Mao to be correct uh, uh, as the, as the uh, leader of uh, uh, the um, uh, revolution in Chiang Kai San, no? Without eh, the regiments uh, commanded by communists, no? Uh, going to, uh, going eventually eh, to, uh, to um, uh, the area where Mao was, no? And, uh, of course, these regiments came about because of the support from the Soviet Union from 20, 1924 to 27. And then um, uh, I have mentioned also the, what, what I call the cross-border um, advantages of the Chinese Revolution. And of course, uh, 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 the Chinese always had well, were self-reliant, but uh, they had um, uh, additional uh, strength from support, from the support nearby Soviet Union. Um, and uh, so um, at the moment, uh, it looks like uh, we have more hope from the Indian Revolution, the people's war going on there, as uh, something that uh, can be helpful, but in, in an indirect way, because uh, um, it is, uh, uh, the, the, the India has a, a big, uh, um, a big area and a big population. So uh, I, I, I usually comment if the, in during the World War One, the Soviet Union arose uh, from uh, from Russia and the and its uh, imperial uh, environs. Um, in the Second World War, China was the big country. Now this time in the resurgence, India promises to um, be the big country where um, uh, the proletariat and the people would uh, make uh, uh, great victories. But you know what is glossed over is that um, uh, in countries where uh, socialism was betrayed by the revisionists, problems are cropping up, and you know. Uh, the people, the proletariat, and the people in these countries uh, have always had a strong hatred for the privatization of the public assets, the social wealth created by uh, the working people. And um, I've been wondering why uh, the Maoists in China and uh, 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 supposedly genuine communists in the in the former Soviet Union or uh, in the Russia and uh, thereabouts, why they have not been able to uh, make use of this public hatred for the uh, privatization of the social wealth and the abusive, um, the, the abuses uh, of the billionaires, no? You know, the billionaires owned uh, great chunks of, uh, of, of the wealth of the country. For instance, in, in China, uh, I read uh, once uh, uh, about uh, only 200 billionaires own 30%, uh, maybe Fred uh, can correct me about the figure, but only so few billionaires own, um, own a great part. And you know, 50%, about 50%, anyway, 50% of the wealth in the world are owned by only uh, uh, a few hundreds of billionaires. And then that obtains, that kind of condition obtains in the former socialist countries. And with the inter-imperialist contradictions developing, I think there will be mutual damage among the imperialist powers. And of course, the most dangerous possibility is that they uh, increase the frequency of wars among themselves directly or indirectly. And you have the threat of uh, the existential threat to mankind uh, uh, by nuclear annihilation. But uh, um, I think there will be a deterioration of conditions uh, in uh, uh, in uh, the imperialist countries um, uh, because you know 
you have uh, all kinds of multiple, uh, uh, all kinds of crises now afflicting. You not only have the um, afflicting the imperialist countries uh, uh, in common. You have you have on you don't have only the crisis of overproduction, um, uh, the crisis of overaccumulation of capital. Uh, you have this. Uh, um, uh, uh, so many ways of squeezing the working class and depriving them of uh, necessary social services, plagues uh, 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 can spread so easily without the proper treatment of the people. You have the plunder and uh, destruction of the environment, uh, and you still have the threat of nuclear war and so on and so forth. So um, you have um, a mutual damage um, going on among the imperialist powers. Uh, you know, imperialism, monopoly capitalism is the source of war. If you study World War I, World War II, and, it, uh, and um, um, these uh, uh, ceaseless wars being conducted by the US, um, they are motivated uh, by uh, the greed of uh, monopoly capitalism. So, uh, but you, uh, in the last more than 70 years, the capitalist powers have sort of agreed to avoid uh, um, uh, inter-imperialist uh, direct uh, wars among imperialist uh, powers and uh, to uh, wage the wars against the uh, underdeveloped countries. Because the, um, since the, the Soviet Union was able to neutralize uh, the nuclear monopoly of the US, uh, and the, the, the US has not been able to repeat uh, the atom bombing of, um, of Nagasaki and Hiroshima because the Soviet Union had already uh, neutralized uh, that nuclear power, the, the nuclear power as early as 1949 and would even use it uh, in Korea, in the Korean War. So anyway, um, there we can hope, uh, uh, although we need more evidence, you know, uh, that the Maoists in China will re resurge. You know? Uh, I'm not limiting the further development of the world proletarian revolution to the Philippines and India and some other countries, but we can we can expect. Uh, you see, uh, the modern revisionist in the, um, in the, uh, in Russia in the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union, thought they had already made peace. Uh, uh, secure uh, by having the Minsk agreement uh, with uh, of 1999 uh, with the U.S., NATO, uh, <laughs> and others. It turns out uh, the revisionists have brought war to Europe as early as uh, the 1990s in Yugoslavia, and then uh, and then uh, you have now the Ukrainian situation, and um, so you have NATO expansion. Whereas the, the foolish, the stupid uh, revisionists and social imperialists uh, uh, had already dissolved the the, uh, the Warsaw Pact, so uh, there is no there is no uh, uh, what do you call uh, there is no real um, trust and confidence among among thieves, you know, among imperialist powers. So uh, greed and um, terrorism of imperialism uh, will make the world um, turbulent and this turbulence will cause a lot of hardship to the people. Um, I'll give you an example of the uh, Ukraine. Um, uh, by the look of things now, by the appearance of things, and definitely NATO expansion is the cause of the troubles. Uh, um, that made uh, uh, Russia uh, 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 undertake this so-called uh, special military operation, which cannot best be uh, uh, described as, uh, as uh, counter-aggression. But, uh, you know, I was surprised this Putin is uh, quite stupid, no? In Marxism-Leninism, it doesn't use that expression. He's, uh, he's well uh, uh, grounded, I think, in the... Um, in recognizing first the two republics in the Donbas region, and then uh, in, in collaboration with them, uh, they have to fight the fascists, eh? 
of Kiev, no? That's what it's, but you know, I noticed he was, he was, he was, uh, despite his, his maturation during the period of uh, uh, modern revisionism, uh, he blames Lenin for the principle of uh, uh, national self-determination as the cause of the disintegration of the Soviet Union. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, the principle of self-determination uh, uh, among nationalities that compose uh, a, uh, um, a nation state um, um, is a counterpoise to the overall national sovereignty of, uh, of, uh, of the uh, federal or unitary state. And um, um, uh, the principle of uh, national self-determination among nationalities uh, guarantees uh, equal rights, no? Uh, so uh, uh, you have a, um, well, Putin still represents the uh, Russian olig oligarchy. Uh, the robbers who took over the social wealth created by the by the Soviet proletariat and uh, uh, people, uh, but we have to evaluate these imperialist powers uh, from case to case. When uh, when certain uh, 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 events and issues arise, um, but anyway, I would expect uh, uh, in Russia right now uh, there are those who. Uh, um, uh, who are uh, prematurely calling for uh, the end of the war, the war of the counter-aggression. Uh, there are also those who are, by, who are watching, biding their time, uh, that the US uh, will generate uh, social disturbance uh, in the, within, the, within Russia. You see, they're not manipulating Chubais, uh, the mastermind of, of privatization against Putin. So we expect uh, uh, this uh, <laughs> contradictions between uh, Russia and the Ukrainian fascists uh, to develop into internal uh, social problems. And the, the proletariat and the rest of the people would have the chance to rise up again, as in the October Revolution. Nang 
mga dayuhan ang bayan sinisihil pabangon lalaban din ang silang ay pupula sa timyas ng paglaya Hindi tayo titigil hanggat di nagwawagi Ang ating mithiing magkapantay-pantay Walang magsasamantala, walang mang aapi Yan ang sandigan ng ating pamumuhay Ihahakbang natin ang bagong kaisipan ng pinakasunong na uri ng lipunan Mananaig ang diwa ng proletaryo Bawat hakbang natin patungong sosyalismo Magbabago ang paggamit ng ating makina Hindi na gagamitin sa pagsasamantala Ating yayariin natin lamang gagamitin Walang pagtutubuan sa ating lilikhain Pasya ng karamihan ay agad lilikumin Agad tutupin ang walang aling langan Babaguhin ang proletaryo ang buong mundo Bawat hakbang natin patungong sosyalismo hindi tayo titigil hanggat di nagwawagi Ang ating mithiing magkapantay-pantay Walang magsasamantala, walang mang-aapi Yan ang sandigan ng ating pamumuhay